Good morning. I'll have to, I'll have to, I'll have to get, get used to the change in audience because normally I've got a lecture theatre full of students where they're all sat at the back and making loads of noise. <laughs> I try and get their attention, but kind of, I come to the front and it all goes quiet. Quite bizarre, really. Okay. Hello and, and, uh, and welcome to this first science and en engin engineering for cultural heritage and conservation conference. It's hosted by the Search Network of, of, of Excellence and, and, and supported by, as the banners, the uh, Institute for for Molecular Science and Engineering here at Imperial College. I'm Ambrose, T Ambrose Taylor. I'm Professor of Materials en Engineering here at Imperial and one of the search network leads. So I'd, I'd like to welcome you to this, this e event. And it's a little bit of a trial. We put the invitation out there. To see, to see who would come. And what we've got, we've got lots of people from different backgrounds and different, different, different disciplines, so there's great opportunities for, uh, for networking. So this symposium was designed to provide a forum, forum for science researchers, engineers, uh, students, and cultural heritage professionals to meet, explore the current challenges, outline tools and, and, and techniques, and also to build collaborations between different organizations. So we will hear, hear today from, from people from many different disciplines, and we've tried to organize the uh, program of talks that there is some there is quite a, quite a lot of variety in there um, so hopefully what we can do is as you talk talk you can ex explore possibilities for cross disciplinary <laughs> cross-disciplinary collaborations in science and engineering research for cultural heritage. And I suppose what I, what, I, what I should really do is give a little bit of an introduction to what the search network is. It's, it's the Science and Engineering Research for Cultural Heritage <laughs> Network, and it really started out from me looking at the work that was going on here at, here at Imperial College and seeing that there are academics working on, on different, different, different topics, but they weren't really aware of what other people were actually doing. So what we decided to do was to form a, 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 a network to encourage existing collaborations and also foster, foster new ones. Um, there's more inf information about search on the uh, website. The uh, link is there and there's some, 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 some little business cards outside with the link on as well. Um, and that, that includes open access to some of the, some of the cultural her heritage related publications that have come out of Im Imperial College and examples of the research work in this area as well. And it's, it's also got uh, links to the various people who are working in this area of part of what they do. Um, and if, if the network has its roots in Albertopolis. That's the, the uh, nickname for this area of, 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 of London that was established after the great, great exhibition, of course, championed by, by Prince Albert. 
and I've, I know the institutions along Ex Ex Exhibition Road in the wider area work, work together, but it's often in a, in a frag fragmented way. Um, so one of the things we, we aim to do is to encourage the, 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 the co collaborations with Imperial, other institutions, other universities, okay? It isn't just Albertopolis, it isn't just Imperial. We, we'd like to encourage wider collaborations as well. And, of course, if you're thinking how, how can an institution like mine and, and a university collaborate, well, there are, there are, there are many different different ways. Sometimes it's just you have a research question, you have a problem, you, you would like an answer to, you'd like to talk to an expert, okay, who, 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 who might be able to, to help you with that. By all means, get, get in contact, we can, we can see if we can put you in touch, touch with the right person, talk to the people here, find out what people are doing, find out who might be able to help you. Then, if you want to do a little bit more work on it, it, it can be a full research project, for example, AHRC or EPSRC funded, and we'll be hearing from the AHRC later on. It might be PhD studentships, self-funded PhD students. It might, it might just be, be a network of people who are working in a similar area trying to answer questions. Or, of course, we, there are un undergraduates and, and masters courses as well, those, those students do, do, do research projects, and that can be a, a useful way of moving a, a topic area forward and finding out what can be done in a particular area. So the aim of, aim of, aim of today is, is networking, okay, with some interesting talks to uh, spark off I, <laughs> ideas. So, so, so please talk to people in the breaks. The, the breaks and lunch will just, just be outside. There are, there, are, there are posters there as well. If you want to be kept informed of, of, of future events, drop us an email. We'll add you to the mailing list and you can, you can receive information about anything else we, 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 we do in the future. Now, this event is supported by, by IMSI, who have very kindly given their staff, staff time and excellent organization to, to help host, host this. So I ought to say a, a little bit about them. The Institute for, for Molecular Science and Engineering is one of Imperial's global institutes. Basically, they designed to draw on the strength of the four four faculties we have here at Imperial to address some of the grand challenges facing the world. Um, IMSI's activities are focused on tackling prob problems where, where molecular innovation plays, plays an important role. And IMSI was set up to bring together people from different different disciplines, because across the sort of length scales you're talking about, it, isn't, it can't be done by people from particular discipline. So it might be scientists and engineers, biologists, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so, so, so for IMSI, it's a, it's a case of, of, of believing that to be at the forefront of solving these these, the, these research challenges, they need to bring people together from, from different backgrounds. That's why we, as a, as a network, fit, fit, in, fit in very well with what they aim to do. Um, and that, that, that brings us on to the start of, of our, our presentations. Our first, first talk, talk Today is a presentation from, from Dr. Susan, Susan Mossman, who will be joining us on, online. Um, unfortunately, we can't have a, have a, have a Q&A session after, after this because, because the, the technicalities are just a little bit, bit difficult. 
Okay. Um, however, I'll, I'll give an in introduction to Susan. She's specialised in, in the history and preservation of plastics with additional research interests in material science, archaeometallurgy, and museological studies. Her, her, her professional career has been spent at, at, at the Science Museum, i.e. next door, uh, as a curator, project leader, and now as an honorary research associate. Her publications include Early, Early Plastics Perspectives 1850 to 1950 and Fantastic Plastics. She was lead cu curator on the plas Plasticity ex Exhibition at the Science <laughs> Museum. She's she a fellow of the Institute of Materials, Mineral and Mining and chairs the Plastics Historical Society. So I will now hand over to Susan. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I, I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, I can't see you. I hope you can see me. Um, and thanks to the organisers for allowing me to speak today. Unfortunately, the COVID got me, which is why I can't be with you today. And I'm so disappointed not to be able to see you and talk to everybody here and listen in person to the various um, presentations which I look forward to looking at in the future and obviously my publication my presentation was supposed to be at the end of the day excuse me rather than the beginning of the day um, but I hope it won't discommode you too much that it's at the beginning and also I note from the other presentations most of the others are all about anal analytical science and mine's rather much more of an overview so it's a very different approach but hopefully um, you might well find it of interest. So it's really going down a rabbit hole, really. Um, sustainable polymers, are they really what they seem? Because that's the big thing out there now, isn't it? Um, let's put this slide down. Yeah. Are they fashionable? Um, sustainable polymers, increasingly important. There's an increased focus on biopolymers with a variety now available. Um, and one asks the question, how sustainable are they really? And also looking at that term greenwashing, which is out there, and I think we need to be aware of it. And also things are supposed to be compostable, but are they really that compostable? I mean, people ask these questions. So people are being sold these things, thinking they're doing the right thing, but are they really what they seem? So I've spent my life sort of looking, academic life, looking at the history of plastics and obviously we're looking at the, the good the bad and the ugly of them really um here um i've talked about the greenwashing by manufacturers um the fact that most so-called biopolymers are natural materials but they're mixed with more oil-based polymers that and there's also not always manufacturers aren't always that clear about production processes and compostability a big project that's been run by UCL under Mark Miodovnik. Um, results from the first phase of that has shown that not all biopolymers are easily degradable or compostable and may special conditions. And looking a little bit at UCL, and I, I have to say that I've got an interest there because the last year I was head of a, um, a collection there um, in one of their UCL museums, so I've got a, a little bit of an affiliation there now. Um, they had this designing out plastic waste project um, and they also had a compostable plastics project um, and these have followed on from their 2019 big compost experiment so if you don't know about it do look at the link up on the screen and it did reveal um, a lack of biodegradability in many biopolymers in a domestic context and the designing out plastic waste was an 18-month project funded by the UKRI and EPSRC. And it was looking at new ways to design, uh, design out um, waste from plastics packaging and create new business opportunities. And I know that the, the, the project team and Mark Miodovnik in particular um, has the premise that waste is a failure to design. So there's ways of people can look at it in different ways. And there's a whole list here um, that we want to have made sure that plastics are reusable, recyclable or compostable and have waste methods, um, collection methods that actually um, encourage a more proactive approach to recycling. 
Plus, things have to be economical and there needs to be market incentives. Because years ago, I attended a, an Interplus conference where people, councils were not even involved in recycling projects because it, it was basically e economically unviable. Of course, there's been a bit of a turnaround, but we've still got a way to go. Um, and again, um, it's interesting to say that from that project, 84% of UK households say that they will likely choose, choose projects that are marked biodegradable or compostable. And as I said, there's this um, three year follow on project from that initial project. And it's worth again looking at some of the results of that. Um, so I won't dwell too much on that, but it, it is worth looking at. And just looking at early examples, cellulosics, a lot of people here, certainly in the museum world and in conservation science, are interested in cellulosics. Um, 19th century semi-synthetics, parkazine here, which we have a lot in the Science Museum, um, which was a cellul cellulose nitrate-based plastic, um, followed on by xylenite iphoride, Daniel Spill, who was his works manager, also based on cellulose nitrate, celluloid, um, developed by the Hyatt brothers, and later cellulose acetate. And cellulosics are an interesting class of materials that are worth looking at and people have been looking at it in different ways perhaps looking at how we can adapt some of these semi-synthetic materials to new applications so I won't dwell too much on that but it's just showing that there's a bit of history there and perspectives have changed um, in, in the 1970s um, Lyocell was developed and it had where, where they were looking at um, looking at the natural qualities and disadvantages of cellulosics and turning them to advantage. And they were looking at a more user-friendly and sustainable method for, to manufacture it and um, select materials for it. Um, and it's quite important because Lyocell, it's, um, they were looking at more environmentally friendly ways to um, develop um, viscous fibres because um, there are some rather nasty um, uh, solvents that have been used historically in its production. So um, this was a, a more um, user friendly and environmentally friendly um, product. And what was the history of this? Um, Lyos of Tensil is really a sort of a, business, um, a, a, a trademark name for Lyocell. Cortols were seeking a replacement for Viscous. They developed the Genesis pro project. Um, I've already mentioned um, looking at using more environmentally friendly um, methods. And they were looking at sort of basic um, methodologies to develop um, materials in, in, a, in a better way. And again, the first research team were mostly chemists and physicists, and they were looking to understand the fundamentals of the material. And they scaled in the 1980s from concept to from bench to commercial production and then on to full scale production. And if you look, um, the actual over, overall process was from forest to end product, but using um, environmentally friendly um, in, um, interim solvents rather than carbon disulfide, which was one of the products that had been used in the production of early viscous, which if, well, if you look at the history of viscous, had some rather nasty impacts on workers, etc. 1990s, another case study, Biopol, ICI, um, took 15 years to develop it. It was ahead of its time, based on PHB. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that word. Degrades to form uh, to form um, CO2 and water. And um, it's made using a bacterium, which again, I'm not going to try and mention, um, in a broth of glucose and essential nutrients. And interesting product, got properties no, um, close to polypropylene, um, it was highlighted in the New Scientist in 1990, but the problem was the first products that they used to make from this product were bottles. Not a good choice, an application for this product, because people didn't really want to um, just have biodegradable bottles. Um, this wasn't a good, um, it, so it really wasn't very, very commercially successful. But it has had a new lease of life in the 21st century and is used for applications such as yogurt pot lids, and for single um, use, uh, single uses as well, and is compostable. And they are looking at other methods as well to produce it. So again, it's it's had a new lease of life after a, perhaps a sort of hiccupy start. 
And then looking at novel biopolymers, um, people have been looking, for example, at fish and insect and plant waste. There's a company in, in, in Scotland called Contec who've been looking at um, uh, polymers, biopolymers from fish waste, initially from fish waste, but looking at, they widened their remit to insect and plant waste. And they're looking at um, chitine as a basic um, material together with proteins and minerals and they, they separate that from shellfish waste and now mushrooms and insects and produce a whole range of bio-based um, products and again these can be used for um, single-use plastics and for applications such as cosmetics, fibres, drug deliver delivery and other applications. Algae um, is another area. Now, there's a, so a lot of work historically been done by Mary Brooks. She had to come and see some early samples had, we had in the Science Museum collections. But again, things have moved on. I mean, look at the sequin dress that was um, on display at the Design Museum a year ago with algae um, sequins. Again, sequins you might not think were a problem, but sequins were made of some sort of um, non-degradable um, polymer. If you can make them of algae, when that um, dress goes into um, compost, if it goes into that area, they can degrade or they can actually safely go into the um, landfill. But you can also make vessels out of these. So there's again a whole range of new products being made of this material. Um, mushrooms, we talked about um, that previous um, firm looking at mushrooms. Um, mushrooms fungi are another area of core material, again using mushrooms to actually produce, in this case, um, building materials and fire retardant materials. So again, really, really interesting. And again, this example was at the Waste Exhibition, Waste Exhibition at the Design Museum last year. Um, polylactic acid. Um, again, this is um, a, a material, a biopolymer, and people are, are looking to make products out of this. This is a cotton dress with, uh, with um, uh, using um, polylactic acid in within the petticoat. So again, it's using it in fashion, but it has a wider um, application as well, this plant-based polymer. Um, here, again, an example from the um, Design Museum exhibition, they're using even for applications such as furniture now. So again, really interesting uses of plant-based um, polymers, biopolymers. Pineapples haven't been left alone either. Um, there's a company called Ananas Anam Limited who are using pineapple leaf waste. Now, Historically, leaf waste has been used to make various things like woven fibres, but now they're looking to exploit it more. And it's not fully biodegradable yet, but they're working on this. I mean, I'm not going to go too much into detail, but this is how they actually um, process pineapple leaves. They gather it, they harvest it, they um, process it, they produce a product, and it, they process it to make a pine felt and then it goes um, there to actually, it's mixed with pigments and potentially coated to actually improve its properties. And then it can be um, made into a variety of different products, as you can see here. And this is just an overview of the production processes for pineapple. So again, looking at plants in a different way, in perhaps an area that where what was waste can now actually be a product and a biopolymer. Bamboo fibres. Yes, now bamboo fibre is an interesting area. Um, again, a cellulosic fibre regenerated from bamboo plant and it's produced from alkaline hydrolysis and multiphase bleaching of bamboo stems and leaves and then chemically treated um, during the process. But it uses carbon disulfide as a solvent. And I would reference you to this book I show on the screen, Fake Silk, by a Paul David Blanc, where he talks about the viscous rayon um, industry and the use of carbon disulfide and its nasty impacts there. So, again, bamboo fibres may seem a friendly option, but are they if they're using some of those toxic solvents in its production? And again, I won't dwell on this, but various processes for its production. And again, it's interesting to reflect on a comment by um, from the EU looking at what bamboo um, uh, products can um, contain. They can contain grand, 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 ground bamboo, brackets, bamboo melanine, 
um, which I think any scientist here will know is not biodegradable, and they're labelled and marketed as biodegradable, eco-friendly, organic or natural, or 100% bamboo, which does not reflect the true nature of their product. So again, this is misleading. So it's being aware of the misleading marketing. Now, when I was researching this talk, I went really down another rabbit hole, which was vegan leather. What is vegan leather? Vegan leather, look at this list. It can be PVC. It can be polyurethane, pineapple leather. I've talked already about Pinatex, apple leather, cork, grape, cactus, corn leather, and something called mirum. PVC being the least environmentally friendly option in there. And polyurethane is used as a coating on a whole range of those other plant-based vegan leathers. And I already mentioned that pineapple leather is not yet biodegradable. Apple leather also uses um, polyurethane as well. So it's mixed in with polyurethane and coated onto cotton and polyester. And of course, the resulting leather, vegan leather, contains a minimum of at least 50 apple, um, fifty percent apple fibre, but the rest being something like polyurethane. So not in terribly vegan, is it? If, if you were thinking, I bet a vegan would might think potentially this is all natural products. So again, a bit of misleading marketing there. Again, I won't go into detail, but you can see that cork leather may be the most unfriendly of the lot because it is pure leather. Um, it, it is pure cork, which is steamed, boiled and then pressed into a natural leather. Grape leather from grape skins, which actually still has 22% of a water-based polyurethane. Um, cactus leather, only partially biodegradable. And again, only 50% cactus so again, it's it's a bit of a misleading um, label, vegan leather. Mirum seems to be perhaps one of the ways forward, an American company, which is purely um, plant-based, with plant-based um, waxes and oils, all waste materials, and using responsibly sourced natural rubber, plant-based oil, natural pigments and minerals, no synthetic plastic or petroleum-based components, durable and resistant. So again, and biodegradable in certain conditions. So again, this is a company that really are taking it perhaps to the next level. And perhaps this is one of the ways forward. So, and I don't have much time today, but conserving biopolymers, and because I come from a museum background and a lot of people here may well be from a conservation background, what will collecting and conserving biopolymers mean for museums? Um, they're very fugitive, they degrade. We've already had a whole area of issues with degrading um, cellulose nitrate, cellulosic, cellulose acetate, um, polyurethane, early polyurethanes, PVCs have been problematic for museums. So all of those materials can be problematic. So there's going to be some hard choices to be made. Will they simply be ephemera in our collections? For example, I'll give you an example that was um, displayed at uh, the Trash Fashion um, exhibition at the Science Museum in 2009, and it was designed to use organic and recycled materials. But it's made of cellulose, cellulose produced by millions of tiny bacteria grown in bathtubs of sweet green tea. And you can imagine there might well be conservation issues. So if you're going to acquire this for the collection, there's going to be problems. So it, it's one of those things that, you know, acquire with care. Two other examples we didn't acquire. The dissolving dress by Helen Story that if it gets wet, dissolves. So would you really want to acquire this for a museum collection? Um, the intimacy dress, which actually um, changes colour on um, when the... Um, the body heats up, so I leave you that to your imaginations. But again, longer term, is that going to be sustainable in our collections? So to conclude, um, I just hope that I've begun to allow you to think about further consideration of this class of materials and biopolymers, but perhaps that they may result in new inspiration to plastics inventors, designers and manufacturers. But also, there's concern as to life cycle, and so there must be a move from toxic and dangerous production processes, i.e. the carbon disulfide, which is used now for many bamboo products, and legislation may be needed. Greenwashing is out there. Be aware of what you're buying. Read the label. And actually, be aware that not on the it may or not be telling you the whole truth. 
good substitution of single-use polymers that must be biodegradable because there's absolutely no point having a single-use polymer that doesn't degrade in the environment and easily and is compostable. Um, and hopefully there'll be some biopolymers that can help deal with some critical uses of plastics global waste and resulting um, environmental pollution. And finally, museums will have to explore the feasibility of collection of those items designed to be biodegradable. Documentation rather than collection might be a way forward or accept that these items will be for short term display and then for disposal or reuse. And of course, there may be other options. And obviously, this is a matter of debate. So that's where I'll end because, again, I had 25 minutes. So I hope I've kept time. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you very much. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank Susan very much.